Hello, my name is Evie and I'm one of the current residents at Nepean Hospital. This presentation will entail a brief overview of common comorbidities in surgery and their basic management. For the sake of finishing before next century, it is by no means an exhaustive discussion, but aims to provide you with some basic principles in approach to the common comorbidities that you as a surgical JMO will encounter every day. So why bother? Australia has an ageing population and obviously this results in an increase in the individual's medical comorbidities. Understanding and appropriately managing common comorbidities during the perioperative period significantly impacts patient outcomes. Thus, this presentation aims to assist you in understanding basic perioperative care of diabetics and the difference in care of insulin dependent and non-insulin dependent diabetes. I would like it if um, it assisted you in appreciating the factors influencing perioperative anticoagulation, as well as understanding the impact of lifestyle factors on perioperative outcomes um, to help you assist in possible interventions that may be possible at the time of surgery. As well, um, this presentation aims to assist you in knowing where to go for help when managing more complex comorbidities and um, how best to ask for it. First off, diabetes. Almost every patient that comes through Nepean Hospital thinks to have diabetes and it's highly significant during the perioperative period. Firstly, it results in a higher incidence of post-operative morbidity and mortality. Patients with diabetes in general are just at high risk of post-operative complications. And in general, they have an increased length of stay in comparison to non-diabetics. Poor glycemic control during the perioperative period is strongly correlated with increased post-operative complications. particularly infections. In particular, chronically poor glycemic control with an HbA1c of more than or equal to 7% has been shown to double the risk of postoperative wound infections. Conversely, studies in cardiothoracic and ICU patients have shown good glycemic control in diabetic patients decreases their morbidity and mortality. And these are results which are projected to um, be relevant for all surgical patients, not just cardiothoracic and ICU patients. For most patients, target BSLs will be between 5 to 10 millimoles per litre, although a slightly higher BSL may be appropriate if the patient's known to have symptomatic hypoglycemic episodes at BSLs around 4 to 5. In most hospitals, patients are automatically flagged to the endocrine team for review following hypoglycemic episodes and the request for advice or review is very reasonable if your patient is having multiple episodes of hypoglycemia of more than 10 millimoles um, during their stay. Complications of diabetes may significantly alter the outcomes of surgery and determine the perioperative support required. Many long-term diabetics will have a degree of gastroparesis resulting in incomplete emptying of gastric contents. This may make a prolonged period of fasting necessary, so eight hours of no solid foods rather than six prior to general anaesthetic to decrease the risk of aspiration and induction. Patients with autonomic neuropathy may also have impaired cardiovascular reflexes resulting in hypertension at the induction of anaesthesia as well as an impaired respiratory drive postoperatively, and the anaesthetist should therefore be informed if autonomic neuropathy is present to allow appropriate management. It's always much nicer to be prepared for things like hypotension and a patient who stops breathing. The cardiovascular stress associated with a general anaesthetic and blood loss during surgery may precipitate myocardial ischemia. In a diabetic patient, this may occur without typical symptoms of MI um, or may be completely silent. 
diabetic patients are particularly at risk if they have other macrovascular disease, if they have microalbuminuria or multiple cardiovascular risk factors. So pre-operative cardiac evaluation is usually recommended for these patients to further stratify their risk and to help in the perioperative period. For patients with diabetic nephropathy, avoiding dehydration and avoiding nephrotoxic drugs during the perioperative period is particularly important to prevent further damage to kidney function. Depending on the degree of pre-existing kidney impairment, some medications may also require dose alteration, including antibiotics. Firstly, non-insulin dependent diabetes. This refers to type 2 or type 3 diabetics who have enough residual pancreatic function to be managed solely with diet or oral hypoglycemic medications. During the perioperative period, regular BSL monitoring is still essential as the stress of surgery and being unwell may result in hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia is more likely with the necessary fasting and the risk of post-operative nausea, vomiting or inadequate oral intake. Hourly BSL monitoring is necessary throughout the surgical procedure, though if BSLs remain normal, this can decrease to four to six hourly measurements post-op. Hourly BSLs should continue during the four hours of post-op observation if there's any concern of poor glycemia. Use of an insulin dextrose infusion is indicated if the patient's hyperglycemic throughout this period, even if they would not normally use insulin. The infusion can be ceased when recommencing normal diet postoperatively, usually done by given, giving their normal oral hypoglycemics or basal, basal insulin, feeding them, and then ceasing the infusion an hour or two afterward. The crossover time of the infusion is necessary to ensure the oral hypoglycemic or insulin has time to work prior to ceasing the insulin infusion. If a patient who is not normally on insulin requires an insulin dex infusion in the perioperative period, it's a good idea to contact the endocrine team for further advice on whether their normal regime of oral hypo, hypoglycemic requires further titration or the addition of insulin um, on discharge when they're well. Ideally, patients with diabetes should be first on a morning operating list to minimise disruption of the patient's usual routine and their glycemic control. Whilst oral hypoglycemic medication should be withheld whilst the patient's fasting, for most classes of oral hypoglycemic, it's sufficient to withhold them just on the morning of surgery to recommence when the patient resumes their meals. Our first question. Dave Moreau, a 65-year-old gentleman, has presented to ED with cholecystitis. His febrile and tachycardic and the surge reg starts IV augmentin and books him for an E8 lap cholecystectomy and intraoperative cholangiogram. He's a relatively well postman, apart from having type 2 diabetes. His last HbA1c was 6.6 .6 just a month ago. And for this, he takes Jardians, which is a combo of metformin and empagliflozin, um, morning and night. He last ate last night at 10pm, as he was too nauseous this morning to eat, although he did take his Jardians tablet. So with regards to management, of his diabetes in the perioperative period, which of the following is most correct? A. Both BSLs and blood ketone levels should be measured whilst he is fasting. B. As he is a well-controlled type 2 diabetic, BSL measurements are indicated at four to six hourly intervals. C. He should be started on an insulin dex infusion as he took his oral hypoglycemic medication this morning without eating breakfast. Or D, kidney function is expected to deteriorate from his metformin. The best answer in this situation is A, continuation of an SGLT2 inhibitor such as empagliflozin whilst fasting and immediately preoperatively increases the risk of euglycemic DKA.
Thus, it is important to measure both BSLs and ketones hourly until normal diet recommences postoperatively. Um, to avoid a situation where a patient is both ketotic and acidotic, even though the blood sugar levels are less than 15. B is incorrect. It's far too generalised. While some type 2 diabetics may only require close observation of BSLs during the operation and immediately post-operative, hourly BSL measurements would be indicated at least during the operation itself and potentially for longer if the BSLs were deranged. C is incorrect. Whilst close monitoring would be indicated as a result, it would not be a blanket reason for commencing an insulin dex infusion unless he had labile BSLs subsequently. D is incorrect. Whilst taking metformin whilst fasting can increase the risk of lactic acidosis development and subsequent kidney injury, particularly if dehydrated, metformin itself does not damage kidney function. A special mention to some oral hypoglycemic agents which require a bit more thought regarding their management. Firstly, metformin. Although the risk of lactic acidosis is very small, it is still with recommended to withhold metformin on the day of surgery um, and to following major, major surgery to withhold metformin until the following day and only recommending if there's no deterioration of kidney function as measured by creatinine clearance on morning bloods. Minor surgery, like day-only procedures, don't actually require metformin cessation, except for that withheld dose during the fasting period. Keeping patients well hydrated during the fasting period is recommended to reduce that small risk of lactic acidosis. SGLT2 inhibitor use is associated with a risk of euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis if fasting. In the case of emergency surgery, if the patients already had the SGLT2 inhibitor that day, monitoring both BSLs and blood ketones should occur hourly. Postoperatively, withholding the SGLT2 inhibitor for a further 24 hours or until close to the date of discharge from hospital is recommended. If ketones are more than one millimoles on routine checks, a blood gas should be done to investigate for acidosis. And if the base excess is more than five and ketones are more than one, this is enough reason to commence an insulin dex infusion, even if the BSLs are still within acceptable limits. In this case, advice from an endocrine team is recommended. Both type 1 diabetics and type 2 diabetics normally requiring large amounts of insulin are at risk of DKA during the perioperative period if they are not given appropriate insulin. Significant metabolic stress resulting from surgery increases cortisol production, thereby increasing the glucose mobilised within the body. Without insulin, this leads to DKA. However, excessive amounts of insulin obviously can easily cause hypoglycemia in the fasting patient. Most unwell insulin-dependent insulin -dependent diabetics, especially those undergoing major surgery, will require an insulin dex infusion during the perioperative period. However, for otherwise stable patients awaiting a morning operation, it is possible to manage with titration of their usual subcut insulin. For the purpose of this, I'd highly recommend downloading the free app Thinkshon. There's sufficient complexity within this topic for a whole separate lecture and then some, so we won't be discussing it here. If patients with poorly controlled diabetes ha have 
poorly controlled diabetes or have unstable blood sugar levels in the days prior to surgery, an insulin dex infusion should be used perioperatively, even for minor operations. Insulin dex infusions should then be continued until the patient can resume an adequate diet. A consult to the endocrine team is almost an inevitability for any patient with difficult to manage diabetes. I've put down some of the most important details to include when you're talking to the endocrine team and fortunately they're almost always very very lovely um, and very understanding when you don't know a detail or two but it does help in giving the best advice possible for the patient if you know all the relevant details. Firstly, it's helpful to start with the reason for the consult. Has your patient been having hypoglycemic episodes on their regular, um, on their regular diabetic regime, or are they consistently hyperglycemic? Have you found that they have a high HbA1c or did they come in with a complication of their diabetes, like a necrotic foot ulcer? It's important to know the type of diabetes they have, whether that's one, two, or three related to pancreatic obstruction. Are they non-insulin dependent or insulin dependent? It's really helpful to know what HbA1c they have. Um, in some situations, this will actually be on the low side, uh, like an HbA1c of five, which means that your patient has quite a lot of hypoglycemic episodes. In most cases, though, most cases, though, our diabetic patients have an HbA1c on the higher side, which is a really important thing to know because this indicates that their long-term diabetic control is likely to be poor and therefore merits titration of their insulin or oral hyper hypoglycemia. It's important to know what their management is out of hospital, whether they're known to an endocrinologist or whether their GP manages it. Any new diagnoses of diabetes, so patients who are incidentally noted to have high BSLs or who come in with DKA, all of these patients should definitely be seen by the endocrine team throughout their stay. It's a good idea to know their usual regime of oral hypo, hypoglycemics or insulin and how frequently they'd be measuring their BSLs at home and what range they're generally in. Often patients will say that they have good control of their BSLs because they all, always have BSLs sitting between 12 to 14. So it's helpful to know the details of their BSL control. It's also important to know whether they have any evidence of micro or macro diabetic diabetes mellitus complications. Moving on from diabetes, the next common comorbidity is ischemic heart disease. After a myocardial infarction, any elective non-cardiac surgery should be delayed at least two months to reduce the risk of reinfarction and death during the perioperative period. This may differ in individual cases if reperfusion of the culprit arteries was achieved at the time of MI and depending on the urgency of surgery. However, this decision often takes place in consultation with the cardiologist and the surgeon performing the surgery. High level monitoring is recommended during the perioperative period if surgery proceeds, as subsequent reinfarction carries a very high mortality, as high as 20 to 50 percent. Aspirin is one of the most common antithrombotic agents, and it's commonly used either as primary or secondary prophylaxis for patients with known or suspected ischemic heart disease. And it's important to clarify which of these is the indication for commencement. Often aspirin won't require cessation in the setting of emergency surgery, which is good because it takes quite a number of days to wash out. 
in quantifying the degree of ischemic heart disease, it is very helpful to know the results of any recent angiograms, as angiogram results are generally considered valid for 12 months. And it's important to know the presence of stents and the material of the stents and the timing that they were put there, as this will impact on the decision of whether it's safe to cease antiplatelet agents and whether it's safe to proceed with the surgery itself. Um, the results of an echo are generally considered to be valid for six months and often anaesthetics or cardiology, if they're consulting, will want to know the results of a recent echo or to have another echo performed. Obviously, it's also important to know if your patient has such severe ischemic heart disease that they've needed a cabbage in the past. Question two. Betty Blocker, a 76-year-old female, has presented to, with, to ED with right iliac fossa pain. A CT performed shows appendicitis, though she's clinically well, with elevated inflammatory markers, CRP 130 and white belt up at 14. She has a history of atrial fibrillation with two prior transient ischemic attacks when not anticoagulated, although she is currently on a pixaban, 5 milligrams morning and night, her last dose being last night. Other past medical history are hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, type 2 diabetes, and osteoarthritis. She's started on IV antibiotics and the team is planning for surgery. So what decision-making tools can be used when considering the risk-benefit ratio of withholding anticoagulation? And is there any other information that would be necessary to determine how long a pixaban should be withheld preoperatively? Some tools in determining the risk-benefit ratio are things like the chads vast score, which quantifies a patient's risk of clotting um, in the event of them having atrial fibrillation. The bleeding risk of the surgery, such as the type and length of the planned procedure, should also be considered. There are various tables which quantify bleeding risk, but in general, all abdominal surgery carries a risk of more than or equal to 2% of major bleeding incidences and such is considered to be a high bleeding risk. In terms of other information necessary to determine the washout period, the kidney function or creatinine clearance is important. Um, so as we said, intra-abdominal surgeries carry a high bleeding risk. And this is just a demonstration of the chads vast score using the history that we're given for her. Um, there was a table that the Centre for Clinical Excellence has put out to um, further quantify how atrial fibrillation impacts the risk of thrombosis in the perioperative period. And so her chads vast score actually indicates a very high risk of stroke if her anticoagulation is withheld. One proviso though is that as a JMO you will not be the one who determines whether or not a patient should be off anticoagulation during the perioperative period. Often this is a very complicated decision which requires input from either cardi a cardiology or a haematology team as well as discussion with the surgeon will be performing the operation. In terms of washout period for um, dosing of a pixaban, the kidney function is what determines the washout period. For most people with good kidney functions, in the case of major surgery, the last dose should occur about two to three days prior, although um, this, may, this period may be extended with poor kidney Just a brief word on anticoagulation and antiplatelet agents. It's important to ascertain any blood thinners, whether that's anticoagulants or antiplatelet agents that a patient's taking 
and their indication for it as this assists in determining whether it can be withheld, how long it's safe to do so, and whether they'll need any specialised bridging therapy. Risk of bleeding is generally best assessed by the surgeon or proceduralist. proceduralist. So risk is generally high for any intra-abdominal surgery or surgery lasting more than 45 minutes. Patients on warfarin therapy will generally require specialist advice on perioperative anticoagulation unless their risk of thromboembolism is low, in which case warfarin can be withheld without requiring bridging therapy and can re recommend at prior maintenance dosing. Warfarin generally, generally has a washout period of about five days. Checking INR on both the day prior to and the day of an elective surgery can allow appropriate reversal, reversal if necessary, usually aiming for an INR of less than 1.5 for surgery. Bridging therapy with heparin is required when warfarin interruption is necessary due to bleeding risk but a patient has high risk of thromboembolism. In all these cases, specialist advice is necessary. The treating surgeon will generally determine the post-operative timing for recommencing anticoagulants, which is usually around 48 to 72 hours post-op for patients with normal renal function undergoing major surgery. Whilst DVT prophylaxis may not be necessary for all patients during this period, it's something that should um, be queried um, to ensure that patients are appropriately receiving DVT prophylaxis. Just a quick note, anticoagulation in the perioperative period is very complex, especially in patients with significant clotting or bleeding soft borders. It will often require discussion with hematology, and or a decision from the surgeon regarding the acceptable, acceptable bleeding risk. Always remember the DVT prophylaxis as surgical patients are almost always high risk for DVTs, particularly abdominal surgery or major orthopedic procedures. In general, patients who are young or relatively healthy and those where bleeding is unlikely to be catastrophic are suitable for having clexane for DVT prophylaxis at 40 milligrams daily. In the case of patients with renal insufficiency or crumbly older patients or ones who may need to be rushed back to theatre or where bleeding is highly undesirable, it's generally safer to use heparin 5000 units morning and night as DVT prophylaxis. Patients with COPD are at risk of increased respiratory complications in the perioperative setting related to anesthesia, the surgery itself, and also pain in the postoperative period inhibiting their ability to breathe. These three factors in the COPD patient result in atelectasis, bronchospasm, pneumonia, both aspiration and hospital acquired and prolonged need for mechanical ventilation and respiratory failure during the perioperative setting. In the case of an elective surgery, these should be cancelled or delayed if the patient has an acute exacerbation of their COPD. In severe disease, regional anesthesia should be considered in the case of either emergency or elective procedures to decrease the risk of perioperative complications. Obesity in the perioperative setting comes with an increased risk of difficult ventilation, intubation and postoperative respiratory complications such as atelectasis and pneumonia. Having obstructive sleep apnea also carries these same there's an increased risk of reflux and desaturation for obese patients at the time of intubation. And these risks may be magnified when both obstructive sleep apnea and obesity are present. Postoperatively, um, these risks 
can be decreased with the use of non-sedating analgesics, such as Panadol, Nurofen, and the use of regional pain relief or um, local anaesthetic blocks. It's very, very important to um, provide early mobilisation and intensive chest physio to all obese patients or all patients with COPD to decrease their risk of respiratory complications. For obese patients, they also have an additional, additional increased risk of surgical site infections or wound dehiscence, whilst the increased intra-abdominal pressure also increases the risk of hernia formation at the operation site if it's an abdominal surgery. Some lifestyle factors with significant impact on perioperative, on perioperative morbidity and mortality are smoking and excessive alcohol use. As far as smoking goes, some of the adverse effects include altered mucus secretion and clearance and decreased small airway caliber, both of which increase the risk of atelectasis, as well as bronchospasm at the time of anaesthetic. Atelectasis increases the risk of post-operative pneumonia as well. Smoking also alters the body's immune response, which can increase, well, would increase the risk of surgical site infections and poor wound healing. It's recommended that patients abstain for at least eight weeks preoperatively if possible, or even just a day beforehand can has shown a benefit in decreasing the risk of perioperative morbidity. However, most of the time patients will come in saying that they're now a non-smoker as they haven't smoked since walking into the emergency department. It's important to realise the value of counselling and encouraging healthier lifestyles whilst a patient's in hospital. Often people are more open to change during the period that they've had a health scare. So it's even if someone's been smoking for decades or drinking alcohol, in excessive amounts for decades, being in hospital is actually a really valuable time to offer um, education and assistance in, in cutting down or quitting. In terms of alcohol, determining the level or use of dependence and associated comorbidities from excessive alcohol use is really important. Any patient who's suspected of excessive alcohol use should be put on thiamine during the perioperative period to decrease the risk of developing Wernicke um, whilst they're abstaining in hospital. In general, uh, we, we like to give them as much thiamine as possible. So something like 300 milligrams IV three times a day might be considered for an alcoholic patient who's come in acutely unwell for an emergency surgery. It's also really important to start an alcohol withdrawal scale and to know whether a patient's prone to seizures. In charting, in, in deciding whether a patient should be using diazepam or oxazepam on the AWS score, it's important to also consider their liver function um, as a patient with cirrhosis will not be able to effectively excrete the diazepam if it's used. Oxazepam should be used instead as it's renally excreted. Patients who are prone to seizures and have had many because of alcohol withdrawal in the past will often need um, a background regular dosing of a benzodiazepine. But in all these situations, it is highly appropriate to refer a patient to the drug and alcohol service available in the hospital, um, both for assistance in titrating benzos in the perioperative period and also for advice and counselling. If a patient declines drug and alcohol services, the treating team and us as JMOs are often a valuable point of contact for counselling and encouraging um, cutting down and sustaining. This brings us to the end of the presentation.
hopefully it has been of some value in considering the common comorbidities of our patients in the perioperative period and how their outcomes can be improved by appropriate management. And just always remember to ask for help when you're not sure of how to manage a patient's other medical comorbidities during the perioperative period.